Hi, my name is Luisa Baeta, and today I'm going to be talking about finding a shared vocabulary for type and branding. I've worked as both a type designer and a branding designer in the past, and I've noticed some differences in the way uh, that each discipline talks about type and communicates. And I've also been speaking to a few branding designers and type designers over the past few weeks and collecting thoughts about some of the challenges that we might find uh, in this relationship. When a type designer or a type foundry releases a new project, um, very often they're talking about the client as the company that they made this project for. But very often what actually happens is that in between the type designer and the fi final client, there's a team of branding designers that makes the mediation between these two. So the relationship between the type designer and the branding team is crucial for the success of the project. So these are two design disciplines and they are both creative, but they work differently and they think differently. There is some overlap in the set of skills and in the way of thinking, but there's a, there are also a lot of differences and that can lead to communication challenges. In order to understand how these disciplines communicate about type, we need to understand how their work process is. In general terms, and the order might change a little bit here, but I would say that um, type designers work. First they get a brief, then they do some research, they do an, an ideation phase, which is usually sketching, then they design a few characters and they really fine-tune these until they are in a good place, uh, then they design the rest of the family, um, they do the spacing and the kerning that might happen while they're designing, um, and then there's the QA, the engineering, the hinting, and all of that. The branding designers, they might start with strategy, then they do some visual research and mood boards, maybe not in that order. Um, they will work on the concept, sometimes alongside the visual identity, so the concept will be tied to logo and colors and type and imagery and all of that. Developing the branding system, sometimes also uh, designing the final touch points or even doing a campaign or all of that. So when looking at the work process for branding designers, depending on the project, um, there's really a, a couple of elements in there that are directly related to type. Well, if you look at the work process for type designers, you know, everything is related to type. So I just want us to keep this in mind as we move forward with this presentation, that for type designers, uh, type is the totality of the work and of the project, and they dive really deep on that. Well, for branding designers, this is a part of a bigger project. So how do these two disciplines actually talk about type? So I've been speaking to type designers and to branding designers over the past few weeks and writing down the kind of words that they use when talking about type. Um, so in general, type designers, um, they are more detailed when they talk about type and it's all very type, type specific. I'm calling it a little bit referential in the sense that when describing type, there's a lot of reference to other typefaces, to type design history, to type design theory. It's more technical, it's more visually subtle. It's usually more descriptive. On the other hand, some type designers do struggle to communicate conceptually. Branding designers, on the other hand, very often they look at type and they think of keywords and they think of narratives and they imbue narratives and emotions into the type. They think of type in terms of abstract concepts and they make external associations while visually and in terms of description, it's more obvious characteristics of the type. Um, there is a search for meaning that happens more often. Um, they can be more metaphoric and they do sometimes struggle with a knowledge gap. Here are some examples of some words that I gathered uh, about type designers when talking about type. Open counters, expansion contrast, new grotesque, short descenders. Well, branding designers might say, you know, this is too serious, or this is very grown up, or this is spiky, or this is tasty. So they are different kinds of words that are used to describe the type. This is a generalization, of course, but this is a pattern that I noticed. Um, that doesn't mean that type designers are more objective and branding designers are more subjective because type designers can be very subjective too, especially if you look uh, at reviews from Typographica, uh, type reviews written by type designers about typefaces. There are lots of subjective words such as flavor, warm, elegant, comfortable, punchy, solid, lively, beautiful. So 
it's not exactly about objectivity versus subjectivity, but there is an element of being more descriptive about the visual characteristics of the type uh, versus looking for the feeling that the type conveys. Something that I want to mention in passing, because I think it's actually really a separate issue, is sometimes I think type designers resist talking about uh, type in the way branding designers do because they associate it with marketing language. So by marketing language in this case, I mean the language used in articles or press releases at the time of the release of a new typeface. Um, so, you know, when it's good, it's great. It can explain a thought process that you didn't know it was there and it can point out details that you hadn't seen and it can make you very excited about using a new typeface or seeing it out in the wild. Uh, but very often it's actually not very good and it just comes out reeking of post-rationalization it's often written by someone who is not involved in the process in any way. It's written by somebody from a marketing team that doesn't have anything to do with the branding team, much less the type design team that worked on it. Very often it's filled with cliches, and this can be true also when type designers are releasing their own typefaces. So uh, I don't want to focus on the marketing language now because I think it's... Uh, it's a, it's a separate issue. I'm really interested in discussing how type designers and branding designers can communicate better when they are working on the project rather than how they sell the typeface once it's out there. The reason why I bring it up is because I think marketing language carries a stigma within the type design community that can be associated and bleed into the way type designers think about branding designers. And I just want us to to not think about that. I, I want us to, to know that there can be problems with marketing language, but we we are here working to communicate better with branding designers so that we can make a better project. So on a more practical level, I'd like to point out some common traps, some words that have been known to cause issues in the communication between type designers and branding designers. So uh, one example that I have is color and texture. So when type designers talk about color and texture, they're usually talking about paragraphs. So is the color even? Is the texture, is it dense, is it sparkly? You know, it's about the text in setting, in a paragraph setting. But when branding designers hear the words color and texture, they have a different meaning there. They mean color, is it blue, is it orange, is it millennial pink? Uh, when they think about texture, they're thinking, is it like a grungy font with like some distressed look in it? They're not really thinking about paragraphs. So this is something that if a type designer is going to use these words when talking about the project, um, they should keep in mind that the, the normal understanding of the meaning of these words is very different. Um, the same thing goes for contrast. So contrast is a word that uh, branding designers or graphic designers might use in a different setting. Uh, but when type designers use it, they're talking about the difference between the thicks and the thins, and they're talking about the axis, and the, these are concepts that are not necessarily clear for branding designers, and they should be clarified before moving on with the project. Other terms that can create problems are spacing and kerning, um, also tracking and letting. Branding designers use these terms, but they don't necessarily have a very clear understanding of of what they mean and they sometimes misuse them a little bit or mix them up and that can create communication problems when giving feedback on typefaces. And finally, subjective terms can be really tricky. This is something that a lot of branding designers are guilty of. They will bring up a subjective term like modern and they, they, they want the type designer to understand this and it is very dependent on context. So that's something that can create uh, communication issues. So we talked about how these two dif disciplines talk about type differently, but the bigger issue is that they think about type differently, and that's what I'd like to talk about now. One of the differences, and this is something that we've touched upon briefly already, is what I'm calling the feeling of the type versus the architecture of the type. So branding designers, they are very often looking for the feeling of the type. They're looking for something that's rather elusive when talking about typography they it's part of their job to assign meaning to things and to create a story for that brand type designers very rarely approach a project in these terms they are used to thinking of the structure of the type and that's usually devoid of meaning another difference is a difference in thinking of the structure of type versus thinking of the ornamentation of type 
So branding designers very often are used to looking at type uh, in a different scale and they might look, for instance, they might study the logo very closely and that's only a few letters and they look at it closely and they assign meaning to the shapes of these letters and they change the letters so that these have visual metaphors for other things. Uh, meanwhile, type designers, when they're looking at the shapes of letters, they're always thinking about how these letters repeat in a paragraph and they might initially be more interested in the structure of the typeface rather than small details of ornamentation. Uh, so this is a different expectation of the type design process. So one example, when I was working as a type designer, I once had a client who had a smile on their logo and because of that, they wanted to make the crossbar of the uppercase age be curvy like a smile. And from their perspective, that's putting an element of the brand into the typeface. From my perspective, this choice has consequences. And if you do that to the crossbar of the H, are you gonna do the same to the crossbar of the A? What are you gonna do with the other horizontal lines? What happens to the T? And so on and so forth. So it's something that maybe works well in a small scale, but when you put it into a typeface, it might very easily become like telling the same joke over and over and over again. It is essentially a difference of thinking of the type forms in isolation as a branding designer might and thinking of the typeface as a system where every decision has consequences and ripple effects to other decisions that will happen there. But I'd like to point out that this is not a foreign concept to branding designers. Branding designers are able to think systematically because most branding is a system as well. You cannot change a color over here and expect that not to have a consequence over there. Uh, there is an element of consistency within the branding. So a typeface is a system within a system. And this is conceptual common ground. So thinking back on everything we've discussed, I've separated what I think are the three main challenges to the way branding designers and type designers communicate. The first challenge uh, is what I'm calling explaining jargon. So things like the counter, the bowl, the axis and the contrast, uh, or what we mentioned, the spacing, kerning and letting and tracking. These are terms that need to be understood by both parties. The second challenge is explaining the work process. So these relates to the differences in ways of thinking and ways of working that we've discussed before. So for instance, thinking about tools, Type designers very often have got a, a tool in mind, a similar tool that has written all the letters in their typeface. And this is a, a concept and a way of thinking that might not be familiar to many branding designers, but it's very key to, to understanding the decisions that are made for the typeface. So lettering versus type design, that's something else that's surprisingly common uh, to be a point of confusion for many branding designers and graphic designers. So they might be expecting a typeface to do things that lettering does uh, and be surprised when it can't uh, or shouldn't. There's the other issue that I mentioned, which is an initial focus on structure rather than detailing. And so it might be worth adjusting expectations at the beginning of a project. Something else that might be worth explaining is which decisions have ripple effects. For example, which decisions need to be made at the beginning of a project and which decisions can be changed later. And the third challenge is keeping an open mind. So I'd like to make a call for the type designers watching this. Let's have some empathy. Let's understand that for many branding designers, this might be their first time commissioning type, or if it isn't their first time, it's probably still a bit of a special occasion because most branding projects don't require custom type. So let's understand that their depth of knowledge of type design is not the same as what type designers have. Otherwise they wouldn't be hiring a type designer for the job. I'd also like us to keep an open mind about keywords I know that thinking uh, and talking about type in terms of abstract keywords can be a little bit frustrating for type designers, but it is actually an integral part of the branding process. And if type designers want the branding designers to understand their process when communicating, then they should be open to doing the same thing. I started thinking about other professions where a specialist might need to talk to a layman. And I thought how a good experience with a doctor is usually not just a doctor that can accurately diagnose or cure a problem, but it's also somebody who can communicate to the patient in a way that is very clear and that the patient understands the decisions that they need to make.
of course the doctor knows the jargon of course the doctor is a specialist but they can also explain to the patient in a way that is empathetic and that communicates very very clearly on the other hand i thought of a bad mechanic if you're somebody who doesn't know much about cars and you have to go fix your car and speak to a mechanic about it it can be a stressful situation in brazil we have a, an expression for it uh, that if you don't know much about cars and you go speak to a mechanic they might charge you 500 bucks to change the rebimboca da parafuseta that's a made up term of something that sounds vaguely mechanic -y, but it's completely made up and doesn't actually exist and the person who is there to fix their car doesn't know if it exists or not because it's all a mystery the terms are a mystery you know it's like the Seinfeld sketch about the Johnson rod. So really, we should aim to be good doctors and not bad mechanics when it comes to language and communication about our areas of expertise. So I'd like to finish this by giving a few small tips about communication. So the first tip is to always use visual anchors whenever possible. And this goes for both branding designers and type designers. Both disciplines are designers and are able to communicate visually. So let's use that to our advantage. The next tip is to talk about anatomy. I think it's unreasonable to expect a branding designer to learn the full j jargon of a specialized language within the time frame of the project. Um, but something that does help, especially when communicating quickly via email or on the phone, is to talk about anatomy, to ask the, the branding designer to identify the part of the letter that they're talking about, think about what part of the body does that look like, and just use that. They might not get exactly right of calling it the shoulder or the leg or the ear of the G or all of that, but usually it's enough to make the concept clear and to make sure that the type designer will understand what they're talking about. Which brings me to my final tip. Trust people's capacity to understand. So I know that type design can be complicated and it can be difficult, but in this moment, the branding designers, they are in the middle. They have to communicate the nuances of the project to a bunch of people who are not designers at all. They have already followed the communication from strategists who usually are not designers either. Um, and they are communicating now with the type designer who is a very specialized designer. So they are in a tricky position in the middle, but they don't need to design the type. They just need to understand the principles that you are using when making your decisions. And this can help us have communication that has less friction and that is about everybody working together with the same goal. Thank you.